Hello. Um, it's really wonderful to be here. I'm Anna Neymark, design faculty at SciArc and also the visual studies coordinator. And I want to welcome all the students, um, faculty, and friends here at the SciArc library and also online for this amazing event, uh, which is kind of maybe second or third in person event. So it's really amazing to kind of come back to, to life in a sense. And especially to welcome a good friend and colleague, Andrew Holder, um, who resides in Cambridge, Massachusetts, but is a very frequent guest and visitor here in Los Angeles, because of course he's a graduate of UCLA, but also the co-principal of the LADG, a firm here with uh, Benjamin Fanger. And so as a result, we see him quite often, which is quite a treat. Um, and also, of course, here at SciArc. Um, he won't talk much about his design work. And from what I heard, he'll show 60 different design practices, projects of all his kind of friends and colleagues, but not so much his own. And so he, in a sense, represents today a different um, Andrew Holder, uh, one who is the associate professor at Harvard GSD, and who has co-curated and co-edited um, an exhibition, a course, and uh, a large beige brown book uh, with, um, with uh, Professor Michael Hayes, uh, Key Michael Hayes, uh, also of Harvard's GSD, called Inscriptions, Architecture Before Speech. And um, in this uh, volume, they collect 112 practices, 750 images, and 10 essays uh, by various um, historians and critics. And um, today, Andrew will speak about this project, um, which represents a kind of cross-section through the last decade, let's say, of design work. Um, and with many, of course, also uh, practices represented who are here teaching at SciArc or somehow adjacent to our school. So I'd like to welcome you, Andrew. Um, it's wonderful to have you. Thanks so much, Anna. Um, it's a delight to be here. And uh, I need to say thank you so much to Hernan uh, for having me. He's traveling today, um, but I appreciate the gracious invitation. Um, I lived in Los Angeles for many years, and it's always a pleasure to be at SciArc, um, in part because of the speed of the institution and keeping pace with contemporaneity. So insofar as this book sort of represents my own effort to like, be in sync with the contemporary, uh, it's a kind of honor to be here. Um, so, uh, you know, with the scale of this book and the number of practices represented, I think the, the thanks alone could take the 45 minutes that I intend to speak. And so let me just say to all of the contributors of the book, a kind of blanket thank you. I think there are many different stories to be told about this volume. Um, and I think mm -hmm. I will let the, the essayists and participants sort of speak for themselves. Um, it was a great honor to have their, their participation. Uh, and I'm just going to present um, sort of my own personal uh, lens on this work. Um, I also need to say hi to Michael Hayes, who I think is probably joining us online. Um, hi, Michael, I'm on TV. Uh, <laughs> and uh, say, like, of course, um, as my uh, co-editor, uh, this book could not have happened uh, without you. Uh, and it's been a great pleasure uh, working with Michael now for the better part of four years. So um, Inscriptions is in some ways a, a book about a show. It's not an exhibition catalog in the traditional sense. Rather, I'd think of it as a book that's kind of occasioned by a show. Late in 2017, uh, Michael Hayes and I decided to mount a large-scale survey exhibition of contemporary work, and that show opened in 2018. Um, at the basic level of our own predilections, our own likes and dislikes, uh, we wanted to show work that we liked and work that we thought was maybe underrepresented in terms of critical attention. And so we put on display what was around us. Um, maybe this phrase around us deserves some unpacking in the context of the GSD because it's of course a school closely associated with pre-professional training. Um, but as such, the lines that separate it from other kinds of practice uh, are sort of acutely present. Um, and so we were interested in a class of practitioners who might designate themselves as emerging. 
Um, and while that's a kind of, uh, let's say, buzzy phrase, the emerging practice, I think there's a simple operational definition, which is just practices that practice and build, and on the other hand, they teach, and their commitments to the academy mean that they do things uh, that are not directly commissioned by clients. <clears throat> and so this is the kind of slice of uh, American work that we were interested in. Um, so what did we see in this group circa uh, 2018? Uh, we saw outsized fragments of infrastructure accumulated to afford box-like shelter, but teetering at the outer limits of structural and aesthetic precariousness. We saw structurally stable, conventionally built constructions designed to afford sh shelter in the manner of haphazard stacks. We saw parts accumulated in vast arrays submitted as designs for the most programmatically and technically determined environments like gyms and amphitheaters. We saw masses of parts bundled together in tidy sets so that cutting or joining rooms, roofs, or walls became push-button simple Boolean arithmetic. We saw arrays of rooms stretching horizontally to labyrinthine extremes of repetition, suggesting a life lived navigating unending interiors. Uh, we saw living spaces of another kind, replete with furniture, doors, pianos, and every accoutrement of convention, decoded as clearings from a tangle of marks on cubes or spheres drawn in multiple projections. Uh, and we saw rocks. Um, so just to repeat, box, stack, array, set, maze, body, mark, block, rock. Um, we would say this is an almost nursery rhyme list of a survey of objects in an untidy room. Um, and that's just it. Uh, the logic of the list is the thing-by-thing -thing rec recitation of fundamentals, and so what we recognize here is not so much a kind of overarching commonality of form as what we would say is the flash of recognition itself. Um, so as we began to organize this work for the show, we realized that we could start to identify the source of this familiarity or recognition, this quality of being fundamental in some way, and that it wasn't a question of what forms, but where this sense of familiarity came from. And I mean that like on a map, uh, like from which location, northwest, east, or south, uh, does the sense of familiarity and kind of the fundamental quality come from? And so we began to construct a, a map of that sense, um, beginning with pairs of oppositions. Um, so in a kind of upper left quadrant of our map, uh, a project like this, I'll show sort of four houses to get us started thinking about the organization of the show. So you all probably know this uh, Mira and Matthew's work, Silverhouse Studio. We'd call this imminent, like if it's familiar, it's because it's of the stuff of the world around us. It's one thing stacked on top of another. These are all very familiar parts. Uh, and they belong to the here and now and to the stuff of sort of present worldly gravity. Um, opposed to this would be, for us, a project like this. Um, I'm sure all of you know this, a house by Freeland Buck. What makes this familiar is not at all its kind of situation and everyday gravity, but in fact, it's affiliation with a totally different kind of space altogether. This comes from the realm of idealities and from the mind. Like wherever cubes are located on the map, that's the same space that would uh, contain a house like this. Um, then we saw a kind of equator. So if the, the first two houses, uh, are sort of comprehensible in terms of what a first-person observer can experience or absor absorb, sort of what goes on in your sensorium or in your mind. Uh, a whole other uh, class of projects, let's say like below the equator in our map, uh, have to do with a kind of relational encounter with something else. And so uh, we came to uh, a set of projects here sort of typified by Michelle Chang's AB house. Uh, which require a kind of revelation by an architect. They are familiar because we know that an architect will come to the scene and decode this as a house. It's sort of inscrutable such that it would actually require that process of decoding that makes it familiar to us. Uh, and then lastly, uh, 
there are these uh, projects that we would think of as um, encounters almost with other beings. Uh, that sort of stand on a landscape and have deeply anthropomorphic qualities, either because of their biomorphism, or in this case with the house uh, by Johnson Mark Lee, because of their shape. It's a pavilion of views, uh, but what it's looking at is you, and what makes it familiar are the terms of encounter uh, that you would have with, with any other kind of being um, that's animate like you are. Uh, and so um, these gave us uh, a kind of set of four quadrants uh, that began to anchor the disposition of the work. And those quadrants thickened to include uh, many more projects that have uh, similar sorts of qualities. So in the upper left-hand corner, uh, the kind of imminent sphere of projects, things that are involved with uh, dirt and earth, uh, worldly physics, a kind of um, here and now sort of presence and contingency. Uh, in the upper right, things again that belong to this transcendental space of ideality and uh, the life of the mind that has to be made present really through a process of translation and, and materialization. Um, a whole class of things that we're calling revealed that again require the kind of deciphering of an architect to tell us, oh, this is a house, uh, this is a ceiling, and yet there is something sort of fundamental and familiar and stable, not necessarily about the scrutability of those forms, uh, but about the familiarity of that social relation of the architect as a kind of decipherer or revealer. Uh, and then in the lower left, uh, again, these uh, sort of almost animate projects uh, that demand that you encounter them uh, like you would another being because of their standing on the ground or because of their explicit anthropomorphism. And so altogether, uh, this gave us something sort of resonant with what we know as the semiotic square. That's everything sort of organized in these pairs of oppositions. Uh, the semiotic square is used by you know, linguists and art historians, or at least was uh, used by linguists and art historians uh, to map out a kind of intellectual closure, let's say the, the total space of ideas between a pair of oppositions. Um, we're not at all interested in that. Rather, we're interested, again, in this idea of mapping out uh, where this sense of a kind of fundamental recognition hails from in the case of each of these projects. Why is it uh, that as we look at uh, boxes, stacks, and mazes, we have this uh, sense of already knowing, in a sense, what it is we're looking at. Where does that come from? Uh, OK, so within each of these quadrants, uh, we decided it was sort of possible to further group uh, the projects in sort of loose centers. You'll see in the book, which you're uh, welcome to sort of page through after the talk, that we're promiscuous. So a project will show up in several different categories. Again, we're not interested in the kind of uh, precise and exclusive use of the semiotic square diagram. Um, we're, we're simply interested in sort of kicking loose this question, uh, where does uh, recognition hail from? Uh, so in the 2018 version, we took the semiotic square and we sort of unrolled it like a Z and stuck it on a salon wall in the ground floor of Harvard, what's known as the Drucker Gallery. Uh, and so we got a kind of continuous gradient of projects from left to right that you could look at uh, from different vantages, depending on uh, how far away you were from the wall. Um, the show, I think, left us with a number of questions. Um, and it's these questions that I really want to take as the occasion for uh, the talk today. Um, so the first one. Um, I think it's fair to ask, what is the social and dis disciplinary function of this claim that we have to similarity? Because I think we can be quite honest, architecture at the moment has every political and social interest in characterizing itself as diverse. We need diverse practitioners, and we would expect a kind of homology. If there are diverse practitioners, then the work must also reflect a kind of diversity in the aesthetic sphere, right? Uh, and so if we are identifying some kind of overarching commonality, what is the function of that commonality? 
Is this the sort of trace of a kind of disciplinary conservatism that needs to be rooted out? Or is there a, a kind of more optimistic reading? Uh, and spoiler alert, we, we think there's a kind of more optimistic reading and a different kind of uh, relation to diversity. Um, but it's worth asking the question, what is the social and disciplinary function? Um, the second question was about architecture's relation to history. If we see these things that we think we already know, are we returning to a moment that is kind of like postmodernism in its, I, I don't love the use of that phrase, but let's say the caricature of postmodernism, where we would imagine buildings like self-consciously quoting uh, other buildings or sort of known fragments of history. Um, and so is that in play again, or is there some other relation to the practice of history, particularly keeping our eye on how history itself has changed over the past 10 years? Uh, so who's a historian and how they practice is not a stable configuration. Uh, and maybe there's been a kind of realignment um, that hasn't yet sort of been called out in terms of how architects and historians work together. And then lastly, like, well, what do we think about this quality of having already known in advance of seeing work that turns out to be have a kind of fundamental familiarity? Again, is that a sort of trace of uh, conservatism? Um, and does it leave open the possibility of new knowledge? Or is there a kind of closure of novelty and exploration? So these are the three questions that I want to sort of sink my teeth into with you guys uh, here. And this is really uh, the kind of work of the book, or at least uh, my essay uh, in the book is concerned with these questions. So um, architects always have to do things in fives, mm -hmm. like that's, that's the burden that Corb's given us. So as a way of digging into these three questions, uh, I'm going to do five points on an architecture of inscription. Uh, so number one, uh, marks, we could also just subtitle this uh, the mm -hmm. mechanism of inscription. Like, uh, what exactly do I mean by that word? Uh, so here I have to spotlight my friend uh, Anna, and I'm going to spend some time talking about the dolmen um, in detail. Um, so what is the dolmen <laughs> in this project? Uh, and where is it? And, and which dolmen? So for those of you who are familiar with First Office's work, um, they have this uh, sort of ongoing uh, fascination with dolmens, um, particularly the French kind, and particularly, particularly the photographs uh, of dolmens made by this guy called uh, Eugène Truta. Uh, and the photographs are gorgeous. Uh, they're kind of like uh, Ansel Adams in their kind of like uh, textural beauty and the kind of precision of the uh, the the black and white artifact itself, and they all kind of look like this. Sometimes there are people in the picture and, and sometimes not. But I think we need to ask, like this work like this may be a feature of first office's writing and a feature of their sort of intellectual preoccupation, but what is the relationship between this dolmen and this thing, which is the, uh, the version of their uh, sort of ongo ongoing Dolman series that was proposed for uh, the PS1 competition uh, at MoMA when that was uh, still a going concern. I think we would have to say that as we move from this to this, this is one of the uh, very beautiful rendered elevations of that project, uh, that there is a kind of erasure of the referent. Like there aren't the same number of legs to the Dolman. And in fact, like in all of uh, Eugène Truta's photographs, I can't find one that looks uh, exactly like this. Uh, and then on top of the kind of erasure of a specific referent, uh, there's an erasure of the formal attributes of this thing. So what is sort of intensely modeled in black and white becomes all stained in, in gray. Uh, what uh, has a kind of intense crenellation of the edge is here sort of re-described in the absolute lowest fidelity pixelization possible, like only the four-sided color block is allowed to stand in for uh, each of the kind of legs and the, the capstone of the dolmen. Um, what is here for me uh, is a kind of emptiness. Um, so the 
relationship between this and this, uh, for me, hinges on the little shims and rotations uh, in this box. They're more visible here in plan. Uh, and in order, uh, so I would actually see those little shims and rotations as sort of picking up on the gravities that obtain in the air around this dolmen, that there is a kind of wedge here in the air around the thing uh, that specifies a particular kind of angle of rotation of the capstone with respect to the feet. Uh, and I see uh, a project like this as actually building itself around those points of fixity uh, as though they are enclosing the hollowness and the emptiness of the, the referent that they just literally white it out uh, with white stain. And so uh, the type five hollow wall construction uh, for me is a kind of like reskinning of uh, the emptiness of the dolmen that they just kind of uh, emptied out. Um, but it's that emptiness is present in a kind of real sense in that the gravity that obtains in the original, the kind of unstableness and shakiness uh, is still here. Um, but other attributes of the thing itself, uh, like its proper name, uh, its location, its author uh, have all been evacuated. So what do I mean by inscription? I mean the kind of marks that an architect make might make on top of uh, a sort of deliberate form of emptiness that is nonetheless still present uh, in some material or, or real way. Uh, and as those marks are made, uh, the thing is actually uh, reinscribed um, into existence. And so when I see a photograph like this, I like to think that these men have just finished sort of drawing the surface of the rock into place uh, and uh, they're sitting atop a kind of hollow construction. But um, marks on top of emptiness, like that's clearly the case in uh, a drawing like this, uh, again by Freeland Buck. Uh, we have no access to uh, the cubes and spheres and polygons uh, in their ceilings, except for the marks that are being made on their surface to describe them. Uh, same would go with this interior of theirs. We literally have these kind of striations across uh, hollow boxes. Uh, that's also the case for a project like Michelle Chang, where marks are being projected onto the surface of a half of a sphere and then reconstituted into a house. Uh, a project like this is a little bit more difficult, but I would like you to imagine this as though uh, there's a sort of scenario with a giant hole punch in the sky uh, that sort of clips up little pieces of confetti that then rain down on the ground. We have no access to that kind of godlike action from above. We only have the sort of residue of its marks uh, that are then uh, sort of left to us as this terrain for seeding. And maybe the, the most difficult would be a project like this, um, one of uh, Liam O'Brien's houses. I would describe this back to you in the language of inscriptions uh, as a house wrapped around the image of a house. That underneath this is some uh, eidetic conception of what a house looks like, like a little uh, pitched roof like this. Uh, and he is wrapping his shingles and all of the material of the rendering around this pre-existing uh, sort of idea of a house uh, that exists in the mind. Uh, maybe then we would say, uh, a project like um, Sean Canty's here uh, does Liam O'Brien one better in that it's not only a kind of eidetic house and elevation, but he's then wrapping this around the hollow core uh, of a courtyard between the two lobes of this house. Okay, so inscription, uh, again, I mean that quite directly and materially uh, as marks on top of a hollow or kind of deliberately empty substrate. Um, the second here, point here is about the qualities of that substrate. Um, I'm going to call uh, the dolmen and all of those forms of emptiness that I just invoked uh, originals. I'll kind of get to the why of that a little bit in, in just a few minutes. Um, but that's the word we use in the book. They're all called originals. And if you look at our nomination of the uh, semiotic square, you'll see this word original uh, appears over and over again as we're again trying to describe where this sense of familiarity comes from. Originals are interesting to us, not necessarily because of their form, 
but because of the kind of task that they agree to discharge or the thing that they say to an audience um, that they're going to do. Hang on. So in the case of something like uh, Michelle Chang's uh, scoring building pavilion, I think the, uh, the original here is a square. And the task is build the square. And she's given herself uh, the sort of additional constraint of building it inside a space that's uh, slightly too small. Uh, and so the square has to sort of rack and uh, deform in order to squeeze into the area uh, that she was given. Uh, we might also say that uh, the original is the task in something like uh, Paul Preisner's um, ferry terminal. Um, he has two of them, and I can't remember uh, the title of this project. Uh, but one of his two uh, ferry terminals. And here the task is to uh, enclose an ovoid section of water uh, and stack it up until it floats. And so you see him inscri inscribing again and again in the planet <coughs> left uh, that oval section of water, that oval patch. So first he does it with tangency uh, in the piers. Then he does it with a more or less uh, kind of contour tracing of its outer limits um, with the decking. Uh, and then he does it in a kind of lo-fi sort of uh, polygonal sketch on top of that uh, with the roof. Um, I would say that's also the case uh, in David Eskenazi's scroll experiments. Uh, here he says to us serially, like, I am going to make a scroll. The scroll is the original. The scroll is the task that he's setting himself. And he is inscribing it with the kind of bare minimum of the elevation of a house, uh, like just a couple of windows and a kind of indication of the structure that might obtain behind. Um, I think originals have some qualities that make them, uh, let's say, useful for this declaration of a task. So they stipulate a measure, like, this patch of water can't be infinitely big or small. It's probably given to Paul uh, by the city or the port. It is physically intelligible to its audience. So it's not a highly abstract or sort of uh, abstruse task that's being given. Uh, instead, it's something that is legible to the audience in almost physical or manual terms. Uh, sometimes graspable and even anthropomorphic relationships. Like, I could do this with my own hands if only my hands were uh, big enough. Uh, and then I think it also stipulates a kind of form of constancy. Like, uh, if you're given this patch of water, you can't do anything here. You can simply uh, sort of like reinscribe its perimeter. Uh, if David is going to offer a scroll, uh, there are like, hard limits to what can and cannot be a scroll in that conception. He's, uh, he's sort of uh, stuck within the bounds of that frame, uh, but it's actually sort of exactly the precision uh, of that task that then enables the kind of creative invention uh, on the back end. Um, so I think we might say that uh, originals are as tasks and as a thing to be done or an agreement uh, to do something that's uh, made with an audience is different than other kinds of, let's say, persistence over time that architecture has dealt with in the recent past. So it's not this kind of smooth embryonic growth that we may have expected of, let's say, something like the parametric project. It's not this miraculous uh, projection uh, from uh, plan into elevation through the orders. Uh, it's certainly not type in the sense that there's some underlying or perfect unification of form and program that sort of endures over the passage of centuries. Uh, instead, for me, an original works more like this. Like your uncle is a real original after he's had a few too many drinks at Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, it's a kind of uh, socially defined role with respect to an audience that has a kind of resistance or presence uh, in that space where the architect sort of uh, says, like, this is what I'm going to do. 
Um, let's see. Uh, point three is about um, gathering. And I think here we come to uh, maybe some of the, the social ambitions of the project and, and start to answer um, how it is that actually uh, a kind of overarching theory of commonality among this uh, body of practitioners actually has a positive relationship to the, the project of uh, diversity. <clears throat> so uh, point three here is a little bit of a misnomer. It actually has two sort of sub points that I'll, I'll take individually. So um, the first of those uh, about gathering. Um, let's return to Mira and Matthew's Silver House Studio. So just first, how is this an inscription? Well, they say they're gonna give us a studio. As you guys know in LA, that's a kind of squishy, uh, slightly generic term. It could mean anything from like a converted garage to a kind of proper ADU to an artist space. It's probably attached to a house, but we don't know. Um, and they start to uh, take that sort of empty idea and mark out uh, the sort of edges of that hollow construction. And I mean this again in a very direct way. So it's measured from the inside by a kind of uh, column grid with uh, what I assume are sort of lap joints uh, that connect uh, the horizontal to the vertical in there that accounts for the kind of slight offset of the two. And then they drape it uh, from the outside and it's kind of double draped first with uh, this sort of quilted bat insulation, and then again with uh, light gauge steel framing that's kind of holding the bat insulation in place. Um, for me, this works kind of like a dressmaker's form. They are uh, sort of draping and measuring out this kind of blank and empty body underneath. And they're doing it in a theatrical mode that would be called apostrophe. They're draping and addressing an inanimate object. They're kind of speaking to the studio. And they're doing it uh, in a way that, again, is broadly intelligible to an audience, broadly intelligible to their client. Uh, and because the architect isn't inventing this inanimate object, but is rather addressing it, by propping it from the inside, by draping over top, by kind of scaffolding the draping. Uh, that role of authorship is something uh, that can sort of intellectually be taken up by anyone else who happens to be in the room. Uh, and those kinds of uh, decisions that are being made in the space of the design studio are again from like a purely cognitive point of view open uh, and democrat democratic. And so I would say as a design procedure, this to me enables a kind of gathering. I wouldn't call it, uh, let's say participatory design exactly, um, but I would say the audience or observer is actually able to post rationalize mm -hmm. alternate configurations, like they might have done it differently, uh, they might do it too. Uh, that's for me also the case in a project like Bear Ballier's Next Port of Call. Uh, they're addressing these kind of snugly twisty things uh, and uh, telling us how they might arrange in the space of the Packard plant. And their project even comes with a kind of uh, behind the scenes instruction kit, like here's how these things uh, can sort of snuggle and bend and twist. Uh, and making a little fragment of the city is simply like arraying the troops. Uh, just tell them where to go. Uh, that for me is also the case with uh, a set of projects by uh, Medium Office uh, called their Stack Villa series. Uh, again, it's like a kind of uh, Lego construction that's available to the audience. Uh, they are addressing the project of making the house to this inanimate thing. Uh, in a way that opens up alternate conceptions of what it might be, uh, and the audience can participate in the kind of alternate versioning of these things. Um, there is a second way in which I think projects and inscriptions uh, promote a kind of gathering, and it's, it's a bit more difficult, but I think um, worth talking through briefly. I would say if this is about holding an object in common and addressing this inanimate object, 
uh, not as though you are kind of the genius author and exclusive sponsor of, of that architecture, but as though it's a kind of object in common. Uh, this is about um, a sort of opening up of multiple subject positions. In other words, as you look at this, who does it allow you to be in terms of your, uh, the thinking that you could bring to bear uh, as a reader of a project like this? Um, and what's interesting to me about uh, these projects of inscription that are always intensely involved with a kind of evidencing of the manual mark making on top of the, the surface of the original underneath uh, is that uh, as you read them after the fact, your readership starts to collide with the stuff of construction uh, and it offers you a kind of uh, foothold in the procedures of construction. So uh, if I'm looking at this elevation as a sensualist, uh, the screws uh, and the kind of like over-determination and the over-securement of the plywood panelization to uh, the stick framing underneath, all these little dots are screws, uh, it produces in me uh, the impression of albedo or a kind of uh, modeled reflectivity of that surface. Uh, for the organizational analyst, uh, the hollow cavity construction uh, produces feet-like rooms uh, partially enclosed by a hollow plenum atop. Uh, for the spectacularist, I might pay attention to the kind of residues of gravity that are still on the scene even after they've taken away the original uh, referent of the dolmen, and the list would sort of go on and on. In a practice like Michelle Chang's, uh, she actually begins to tailor what she calls her specification documents to anticipate one by one the kinds of subjects who might arrive at the scene and become sort of entangled uh, in the constructive uh, accumulation of marks on top of the surface of her project. Uh, okay, four. Um, on history or uh, like how to use um, shocks and ruptures. So I mentioned earlier that maybe the practice of history uh, isn't a stable thing over time, uh, but in fact changes from year to year. Uh, and I think maybe we have a pretty clear idea of who the historian is uh, circa 2022, or at least the kind of successful academic historian. Uh, and almost without exception, these are people who have turned to what we would call a materialist uh, reading of history, where maybe we're not so much interested um, in architecture's forms and its kind of uh, disciplinary machinations, but instead they're very interested in the kind of flows of documents that might produce those forms or let's say the networks of labor that might produce them, or uh, the systems of regulation, uh, or even the kind of organization of the architect's offices uh, that might produce those forms. Um, I think just in full disclosure, I own all three of these books. I think these are uh, fabulous historians and uh, really brilliant books. Uh, but I do think it is fair to say that there is a kind of uh, let's say, uh, consistency uh, to the kinds of work being done by um, the sort of preeminent academic historians of architecture at this moment. Uh, I think that that work in books is being uh, sort of reiterated in a great deal of contemporary exhibition work. Uh, and again, I, I have to say I'm like a kind of fan and admirer of all of this. So. Uh, for instance, when Sylvia Levin mounted her show uh, recently at Princeton, um, kind of about architectural drawing, but really about the kind of procedures and mechanisms of architects drawing trees. Uh, so uh, that kind of like empirically observable uh, like set of stuff that's happening around the uh, architect's practice. Uh, this is Giobrana Brasi's uh, show, The Other Architect at the CCA. Again, maybe not so much interested in the buildings that come out of an architecture practice, but in the organization of the practice itself. Uh, and then a recent one uh, at OSU called Fulfilled uh, that was about the boxes 
that were shipped to the gallery to deliver the architectural artifacts. So the, in this case, the USPS boxes were uh, actually exhibited alongside the works themselves. So a kind of interest in logistics over, uh, let's say, models or drawings. So I think that we would expect with this kind of materialist work um, that because it has turned away from architecture's forms and its own sort of self-professed disciplinary interests, that in fact there would be a kind of tense or non-productive relation uh, between architects in our catalog uh, and historians. But in fact, for us, that's not at all the case. Um, in fact, we're finding a relationship of what I would call adaptive uh, reuse, where architects are taking up material that's introduced by historians uh, and using it to produce uh, new architectures uh, that we would classify as belonging to this uh, group that we're, we're nominating um, inscriptions. And so uh, just to take one example, uh, this is Zainab Alexander's uh, recent book, Kinesthetic Knowing, again, a, a brilliant book. And here she's using these kind of materialist strategies um, to examine uh, the sort of myth that we can feel form, that it the kind of sight of it literally impresses itself on our brain uh, such that we can have a kind of psychomotor reaction to ascertaining form. And she goes back to sort of like foundational episodes in the history of how we came to think that way. Uh, and one episode she identifies uh, is by this guy named Rudolf Schulze, where he's actually testing uh, a group of uh, school-age girls to see how their faces change when they're shown a picture of a swan as opposed to, uh, let's say, a picture of a mountain or a picture of a flower. Uh, so here is the kind of stimulating picture of form, and here are all their faces uh, showing us a kind of reaction uh, to that form. So what do we see in architecture? Um, I would say uh, a kind of adaptive reuse of exactly that critique. Uh, so if she identified the sort of experimental setup of, arc of having a kind of emotional or psychomotor reaction to form, uh, this is exactly what architects then use uh, as a kind of original that is then uh, uh, sort of inscribed with the other material of that experimental setup, so the photograph. So what is this? It's a field of photographs that are intended to produce a field of reactions. What are these? Uh, these are fields of photographs uh, that are intended to produce uh, a kind of set of affinities or a replacement even for programs. So this is a uh, team's uh, entry for the Ragdale Ring competition where photographs are mapped to giant hollow forms uh, and that takes the place of any sort of familiar uh, let's say, programmatic scripting for an amphitheater. We could think of the photographs actually as generating a, a field of affinities. Uh, this is a project by Office Extents um, where uh, it's a kind of venue for performance. Um, this actually might also be a Ragdale Ring uh, competition submission, but I'll have to sort of check my sources on that. Uh, in any case, again here, uh, a kind of strewing of the field with images uh, is intended to provoke uh, sort of like exactly uh, this uh, cluster of affinities uh, that was maybe uh, called in, under interrogation by uh, Zainab's book. Um, something similar is happening with Fulfilled. So it's a turn of attention to the logistics network uh, like architecture for this exhibition can happen anywhere between the office and the sort of shipping route that takes the architectural artifact to the gallery and that's uh, enabled by the material device of the box. Uh, and what do we see everywhere in contemporary architecture? I would say the material device of the box uh, sort of unfolding itself in uh, sort of non-normative conditions that for me are analogous to a space uh, not quite in the gallery uh, and not quite in the space of the studio. <clears throat> okay, um, the last of the five points is about um, doubt. Uh, 
uh, which goes to this question of if we recognize it, is it okay? And if we recognize uh, these forms, um, does that also mean that there is a kind of foreclosure of knowledge, that we're not learning something new precisely because we already uh, recognize something fundamental uh, in the uh, sort of qualities of the work that, that's collected in the book. Um, this warning has been instilled in us in, as architects um, now for the better part of 50 years. Uh, in architecture, we could trace maybe one of the origins of the suspicion of recognition, a kind of hostility to recognition to uh, this guy. This is our pal uh, Manfredo Tafuri. Uh, and so um, our book has a couple of uh, sort of choice Tafuri quotes um, where we're uh, sort of like returning to the places in his mini texts where he articulates a kind of anxiety about uh, familiarity and familiar forms, uh, really deluding architects into thinking that they've found some form of stable truth, um, when in fact what's happening is that they're ignoring uh, the kind of shocks and ruptures of reality, that they are uh, sort of clinging to uh, a, a form of familiarity as a way of ignoring um, the accrual of new knowledge and also maybe ignoring the kind of affective experience that goes along with accruing new knowledge, that it hurts, that, that it's a shock. Um, that position is buttressed by this guy. So um, when Tufuri says that history is felt as a series of shocks and ruptures, uh, you know, that's an almost direct but unattributed quote to Michel Foucault. Uh, who says uh, sort of more or less the same thing about the discontinuity of history. Uh, and Foucault, in turn, uh, you know, is in conversation with this guy, Louis Althusser, who just flat out tells us, if you recognize something, it's because you were meant to. Uh, it's because the state has already sort of predisposed you uh, to recognize something and to the extent that you recognize the familiar, uh, it is a sign of control. Uh, it, is, it is not a sign of, of freedom uh, or ability to learn. Um, and I think we, we beg to differ in this book uh, that for us, uh, everywhere we see inscriptions and familiarity we actually see a kind of uh, non-normative posture or uh, a kind of adjustment of convention uh, toward uh, new and novel outcomes. Uh, so for us in the stack houses, uh, you know, it's exactly the constant increment of growth in plan and section that produces an excess of inside-outside relations and a kind of diminishing plan toward the top where conventionally you would find uh, like the biggest rooms, uh, command, view, uh, like the ascertainment of your own property. Uh, in a project like Silverhouse Studio, uh, the kind of familiar dressmakers form draped from the top down actually means something kind of radically counterintuitive uh, that holes in the envelope, doors and windows uh, are made from the top down. Uh, and further that um, Every time you get one of those holes, it's a kind of cut uh, that uh, dissociates uh, the envelope from the foundation, uh, even though everywhere else, uh, there's a very tight choreography of uh, plan uh, and what you see uh, in the elevation uh, vertically. And in the dolmen, um, I mean, at the end of this project, uh, on an Andrew say, um, something that's sort of perfect for our purposes, which is that uh, we don't yet know how to live inside one of these. Uh, we don't yet know how to occupy something where only the feet are rooms. The rest of the free uh, space on uh, the ground is sort of partially enclosed by an enormous hollow plenum that perhaps itself also promises to be a room, uh, but is maybe, maybe inaccessible uh, depending on the design of the project. Uh, and so for us, uh, in each of those three instances and in all of the projects in the book, uh, familiarity 
And the reinscription of that familiarity is exactly the means by which uh, convention uh, and uh, let's say normative forms of knowing are undermined. Uh, so for us also, uh, the, the form of the book would aspire to work in much the same way. So you're welcome to page through the book here in just a few minutes, but uh, it's big and it's got a kind of complex organization. So uh, we sort it into categories, exactly like the sort of unrolled uh, salon wall. Um, but we do it several times from lots of little pictures on a page uh, and then working up in several steps to just one image on a page. Again, where uh, this kind of uh, stable uh, sets of zooms in are inscribed by this uh, unruly image content uh, that sort of at every turn uh, threatens to sort of overflow the categorical descriptions that uh, we put forward. And so I'll just close here with what's actually the closing paragraph uh, of the introductory essay. <clears throat> uh, the exceptions and jitters of this book are setting into orbit authors and schemes around ideas that are foreign to their professed positions is itself a demonstration of an alternative political commitment. Our translation of the gallery wall into the pagination of theme and the zoom into chapter divisions uh, does not guarantee a consensus but the book form does provide a prospect from which multiple critical vantages can be joined in a collective exactly around the subject matter of their doubt. This is inscription's promise. First, the ability to gather, disperse, and regather in the mode of doubt, for which knowing and familiarity are not the signifiers of retrograde nostalgia, but indications that stable forms of agreement can be made without surrender to unseeing belief. Second, that the practice of architectural history, uh, the practice of architectural history uh, can reform a relation with architectural futurity by allowing design to convert uh, shocks and blind spots into the raw materials of mobilization. And finally, a transition in discourse from subject formation to plurality formation from the private encounter of the reader with text the, to the projection of new multitudes around designs, forms in common, and architecture before speech. All right, so that's what I've got, and I'm gonna turn it over to these guys for some questions. For me, that's gonna. That's, there's a lot there to process, so I'm try to process it all. But um, I all guess I just wanted to first just like thank you for coming out here and um, and presenting the book and uh, and obviously the show that was at Harvard. Um, it's, it seems like such a generous uh, project to sort of bring everybody together, um, a lot of young practices around the country, and uh, try to make sense of what seems like you know. A, maybe a decade of work that's kind of, to most eyes, pretty disparate and uh, maybe doesn't make, make a lot of, uh, sort of has been calling for a kind of uh, way to start to read it or start to make sense of at least the last, um, the last little chapter of American architecture. Um, and I guess maybe that would be where I would start. And I think you kind of mentioned a little bit, which is um, maybe, I think you call it gathering in the book. Maybe that's, there's a kind of gathering as a formal idea, but. I, I guess like a curious, um, you're an architect and, uh, and you started by saying you're not gonna show your own work today, uh, which I'm sure I think is also quite maybe generous as well, but um, I wonder like your role uh, as being both a kind of peer and friend of so many of the practices in the, the book that you're kind of putting together, um, but also as a, designer and someone who's actually, I think, quite influential to a lot of, to a lot of us, uh, some of the work that you, you and Ben have been doing. Um, I'm curious, like, how do you sort of see your role or maybe the audience that you're trying to speak to as someone who's uh, 
maybe working as somewhat as a theorist also maybe also understands it from the other end as a, a sort of designer and architect. Um, uh, uh, I don't know, how do you sort of work through like bringing people together in a space that has in past, past times maybe kind of been fulfilled by someone we would call a theorist who's, not, who's clearly not the designer or, um, or through architects who are trying to theorize their own work but not everybody else's work, let's say. It seems like a, a very s special position compared to maybe some previous examples. Yeah, so that, that's super generous. Um, and I think it uh, maybe makes me sound like a slightly better person than I actually am. And so I would... Um, Great. <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe just um, sort of offer some pragmatic reasons for me to have this interest. So first, like you're exactly right, many of the people in the show, maybe 30% are friends. Um, you know, others that are sort of known to me and actually a fairly good chunk that I don't know all that well. Um, but it did seem to me that in the last decade, something has shifted in history and theory where I wouldn't even say history and theory anymore. There are professional historians and then there are precious few theorists and there are just a few, few people who still sort of traffic back and forth between those roles. Um, and those few people don't always uh, like have the bandwidth to survey all of the work that's happening. Um, and so it just seemed to me that not enough ink was being spilled about work that I thought was super interesting. Um, and because of the kind of disappearance of this professional moniker, the theorist, um, that, you know, we were going to have to like bootstrap it and do it ourselves to a certain extent. And so that was uh, one of the impulses for the book. Um, another impulse was that, uh, you know, I credit my peers with being super smart. And I knew that there was something in everyone else's work that would also be, you know, operative for mine. And so by trying to sort of dig deep and theorize uh, like a huge range of other people's projects, I think that there was a um, uh, like a intention to bring some of those ideas back into our own practice, or at least maybe clarify our position with respect to a broader field, uh, and start to understand how our work could both get deeper and also sort of more subtle in its relations to the people around us. I mean, I, I think it, like I said, I think it's, it's so generous and it seems like an impossible task, I'll be honest with you, like to try to, to unpack it all. And um, I guess I was wondering too, like there's something about some of the categories as you were presenting it, I was thinking, you know, when we think of imminence um, and you were, I think you were showing in the first slide where you had, like very early, you had four the sort of semiotic square, but replaced with four projects and I think for eminence, you had maybe um, Matthew and Mira's uh, project. And then there was a, a kind of the other one, which was, I think, revealing. And I think it was Michelle's project. Yeah, if you go back. Yeah. Oh, is it? Man, it's been a lot. It's amazing. Yeah, one of these. Yeah. yeah. No, but before it shifts around. OK, before it shifts around. Okay. <laughs> it's too much Let, for me to handle when things move. No yeah. no blinkies. This yeah. one, yeah. And then you had David's and um, and and uh, Mark and Sharon's. and. You know, but I was I was thinking like in in another world where maybe we weren't, um, we, uh, so maybe I don't know, in a sort of different context of architectural theory. I was thinking like was imminence kind of Venturi revealing was Eisenman. Uh, I cannot remember the other two. There was what's the what's David the one David and. and uh, I mean, maybe like Brennan. Rossi would be. Yeah, there was yeah. like there was there would be another time where like almost those would be the sort of figures for a kind of project around those terms at least. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily that this work sort of kind of makes itself into that. But as you were sort of describing those categories, I kept thinking um, there might have been a time where like the idea of a, of a trace or an inscription was related to a certain kind of formal project. The idea of a kind of imminent project was um, maybe kind of related to the easy and the quick, which also sort of had a different kind of figure associated with it. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if like today when we don't necessarily, you know, 
that you can make these kind of categorizations for this work and not necessarily see anything that has to do with any of that. You wouldn't think of those architects or those theorists at all. Um, a, whether that's even a fair categorization on my part to sort of associate it that way, but whether that means also that today we have um, a kind of maybe horizontal uh, mode of working that's not so dependent on clear figures of bringing people together, or whether it's just kind of a, a way to sort of write in your own inscribing onto the field as it, as it is, uh, as it sort of emerges and organizes itself. Uh, so with respect to the last point, um, the kind of horizontality of the field, um, I would absolutely agree with you. Like these practitioners have almost all produced projects that could easily go in another square, working in a kind of different mode, uh, which just suggests uh, like the sort of wide availability of some underlying mode of thought. And so for us, the kind of promiscuity of the projects, like all orbiting what seem to be a pretty familiar set of categories, um, again, is a sign of, uh, I, I don't want to use these words, but I don't know which other words to use, a kind of like structural continuity just underneath the level of what you see with your eyes. Like they're working in the same way and thinking in, in similar ways. Um, and it's, useful for us to start to like set up correspondences between practices that might not otherwise imagine themselves as, as affiliated. I'll follow up on that because I was thinking that the book, and we'll pass it around, uh, I guess maybe after I, I ask the question, I'll pass it around. Um, it's really about pictures. It's a lot of images and visual things. but. The way in which you talk about and the way you have orchestrated this entire exhibition and book is not at all visual in its model. It's structuralist, which is to say the fact that you name this project inscriptions and you talk about speech and you so beautifully write in a kind of picturesque and Baroque way all of the vocabulary that goes into your descriptions of, of all of our work are better than our own. Right? <laughs> kind of like more um, beautiful, ever more kind of charming and, and alluring, right? And I was thinking about this idea of language and speech as a way to really speak on behalf of these images and also to categorize them in ways that are um, according to a kind of logic of a kind of Bart or Krauss, you know, all of... The, the other side, let's say, of theory that um, maybe coexists with some of the figures that David has mentioned in the field of architecture, but now, let's say, in the field of a kind of literary, literary formalism. And I wanted to bring you back to another story, a story also of architecture, maybe two stories, because you talk about originals. So the original story in Genesis where, um, the, I have, yeah, like as a good Jew, I have to go back to the Old Testament and kind of remind us that after, you know, the entire world was flooded and here we are about to be flooded again, for sure. I mean, Ukraine um, and other things. But to that later, um, when the world was flooded and the people after Noah's Ark kind of reemerged and started walking east, um, they came together and decided to honor God and build a huge city and the tower. And God was really upset because no human should really touch the heavens and struck upon them um, a kind of curse so that no one of these architects could ever speak to each other again. And so the Tower of Babel stands as a kind of ruin to this first act of really optimistic architecture. Um, so to, from that story, I want to come to the second story because you spoke also of in the language of inscriptions. Here, I'm trying to use quotations, but I don't have enough for local. <laughs> um, what is this language of inscriptions? It's like you're reproducing a new kind of set of terms. And every time you use a term that we thought we knew, you actually had to recategorize it and redefine it so that we would more accurately use it in the future. Um, but I was, it kind of brought to my mind this idea of the lingua franca, which, you know, in its origin story was um, a kind of pidgin, a language that was spoken among tradespeople who 
didn't speak each other's language, of course, they were struck by the wrath of God of the Old Testament. They couldn't really speak. But in order to produce a kind of trade between each other, they thought of this lingua franca as a way to communicate. And so I'm curious whether this um, beige brown volume is a kind of lingua franca um, for all of us architects who have fallen off Babel, <laughs> Babel's tower, and no longer <laughs> know how to communicate with each other and are in need of um, someone who can kind of teach us the next the next the next way huh i mean uh between the bible and my sort of teacherly posture that you've given me i think i need like a beard or or a cane just a beard <laughs> just, just a beard okay um no I, I mean that's talk about generosity that's extraordinarily generous um look i think for me um the relation between form and discourse is always unstable it's always elective. And if we're going to put words in relation to form, we're always going to need to take a moment to reinvest that discourse form relation with a kind of charge. And it may be the charge of a kind of reminder, or it may be the charge of taking a word you thought you knew and uh, giving it a new meaning, which is what happened to something like the word index, like circa 1995. We all thought we knew. You went to a library to find an index, but it, it turned out it meant this sort of radically different thing and sort of post-Shumi discourse. Um, so the discourse form relationship is always in need of tending, and the, I, in this case, was like very happy to give that a go. Um, I think here it's also worth calling out some of the other perspectives in the book that are um, that I'm very sympathetic to, but maybe I don't share. The book is bookended by Michael at the end and me at the beginning. Um, the way that you described the role of language, I think is very consistent with Michael's project. That for Michael, um, language and thought are very, very close together. Um, that one is potentially a kind of model for another. And he sees uh, a kind of continuity, particularly in uh, like Lacanian psychoanalysis from the 1960s to the present day. Um, I am a great admirer of his reading in that mode. If there's any sort of daylight between me and Michael, it's about uh, whether or not uh, language and thought are so closely related as to model one another. When I talk about uh, assembly, construction, physics, uh, like for me as a designer, those are the kind of fundamental organizations that I'm trying to like track with words. And I would say like even, even good structuralists uh, talk that way. So Foucault is always like, uh, things are on a plane. Something is above another thing. Something is passing through something. The, the language is intensely spatialized and intensely physicalized. Uh, and I would hope that like my section of the book is uh, sort of like the embodied world first uh, and then description and language chasing it. I want to also ask if anybody in the audience would like to ask a question. Um, these mics are, they're slightly connected to this concrete, but there's a floating mic also in the back. Um, so <laughs> Oh, here I think with that one, yeah. Hey, um, I had a question maybe to tug on uh, the historians you presented and their materialist approach. Mm -hmm. And I would say what is apparent from what you shared today, a kind of absence of a materialist approach in the theorization of the book. Mm -hmm. um, so I would imagine that a kind of materialist approach would have to confront what you said at the beginning, that most of the architects are not just practitioners, but that in some way their practice is also subsidized by their role in academic institutions. 
So I think maybe related to that fact, I'm curious um, if you think, or I'm wondering if the book says more about how we teach architecture than how we build. Um, yeah, so for me, it's impossible to hear that question without immediately putting it in like the space of political economy. So when you say uh, teaching subsidizes the practice, like I would take exception to that. I would say like activities in both spheres are equally valid and it's up to the architect to decide the relationship between them. Um, I would find it a depressing world indeed if it was just like professor vampires like attached to the collective student debt wallet and then like going off to like do amazing like subsidized things at their offices. Um, but look, I mean, for me, when I sort of like track my involvement in the field over the last like almost just shy of 20 years, it seems to me as though uh, like we've shifted from uh, the academy being a sort of center of interest to the present day when like the center of the world's interest in architecture is much more on the kind of professional and, and practice side. Um, and uh, that's been a kind of traumatic shift for me. Um, just to be quite flat about what I see out there in the world, I'm not super impressed. Um, it, it doesn't like set me on fire in the way that maybe uh, you know the world of architecture in the early 2000s did, um, in a world that was sort of far more uh, entangled with the academy and far more entangled with attempts to theorize and like raise it to the level of intellection. So I actually see the kind of practitioner academic uh, as a kind of like heroic figure who's trying to divide their attention between the kind of like cold exigencies of like making a living in a marketplace that only tolerates what I consider to be mostly bad work um, and like a set of a kind of commitment to a set of different and frankly better ideals. Um, and so being in that position like obligates you to try to succeed in both domains. I think it's tricky. And so being a kind of admirer of someone whose attention has to be divided in that way, those are like the people I wanted to bring into relief. Yeah. It's, um, there used to be this um, term that the architect could be a kind of public intellectual. Um, and I want to kind of come back a little bit to your undergraduate experience, maybe as a, someone who studied political science. Um, and one, this may be a more critical kind of question. Um, do you think that maybe these are a bunch of private intellectuals? In other words, there are certain things going on right now in the world. Um, uh, we're on the brink of like a World War III. Mm. And none of these architects or projects, um, you know, obviously including ours, are dealing with that issue and are speaking about that directly. Um, yeah. Uh, what, what do we make of that? Yeah. So, um, you know, this is uh, like a common criticism of, let's say, architects of the generation that's heavily sampled in the book. Um, like, where do we see your value systems like evidenced in the work and uh, particularly like your political awareness and engagement? Um, and I suppose part of the effort of the book is to say, uh, that there actually is a kind of incredible generosity that's being offered to the viewing audience if we choose to like think of it in the way that I've laid out. Um, that it's a kind of making available of architecture to, in a pretty democratic way to people who can analogize its assembly to things that they're able to kind of do themselves. Um, 
And so architecture always being this kind of like quasi-public, quasi-private thing, like made, made for and by one person, uh, but like uh, having urban scale effects always, to, to give it that kind of capacity to be read, I think has uh, like a progressive political agenda that's sort of latent in it. Now, is, it, is any of this work like topically about homelessness? or war, um, no. Um, but for me, again, because discourse and form have to be put in relation, I don't know that there's ever such thing as a kind of natural fit between topic and, and architecture. It only happens because we sort of make it happen discursively. Should we have a drink? Should we have a drink? <laughs> so I'd like to um, thank you, Andrew, uh, for this wonderful presentation. Thank you, David, and everybody who is here. Um, thank you for coming. We have a reception outside um, following this event, so please join us uh, for a drink. Great. Thanks, you guys.